Hey everybody, this is Reagan Canope. Welcome back to the Oregon Bridge. We're in a housing crisis. We've got a 140,000 unit shortage right now. And in the next, by 2040, they say we're gonna have 584,000 units short. When you look at the demand for what we need in housing and what we're actually producing, there's a shortage. If you think back at, you know, when everything happened with 2008, the big crash, we're still trying to recover from that. And when everything just stopped, not only did we stop building what we needed to build to maintain what the demand was during that time, you know, they opened the floodgates after that. Oregon is in a housing crisis. The median sale price of a home in Oregon is half a million dollars. In a fast growing city like Bend, that number is approaching three quarters of a million. That's a 70% increase from five years ago. Affordable housing was a major issue in the campaign for governor of Oregon last year. On our first day in office, Governor Tina Kotek signed an executive order that set a goal of building 36,000 homes per year. We build less than 10,000 homes per year right now. It also created a housing production advisory council. These are housing experts, and they're supposed to create a plan to meet the governor's aggressive targets. Their proposal is due by the end of this year. So today we're talking to Jody Hack. She's the CEO of the Oregon Home Builders Association and a lobbyist for the Oregon Realtors and other housing related clients. She's been working on housing issues in Salem. She also served as state legislator for two terms representing Salem and some communities in South Marion County. She also served uh, in leadership for House Republicans. I asked her how we got here today, what the problems are that we need to solve and the way forward. So today it's producing our way out of the housing crisis with Jody Hack. I'm Regan Canope and you're listening to the Oregon Bridge Podcast. Now that the legislative session is over, it's time for Oregon's activists, candidates, and political committees to turn their attention to the 2024 elections. With government regulation of political activities becoming more complicated nearly every year, and with political actors increasingly initiating complaints and litigation to achieve political goals, having experienced legal counsel has become critical to success in the political arena. Harang Long PC has represented clients involved in candidate and ballot measure elections for decades. To learn more about Harang Long's political law practice, check out our website at harang.com. That's www.harrang.com. Welcome to the uh, Oregon Bridge podcast. Jody Hack, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. So I wanted to start because you have um, a background in not just uh, housing, although you have done that for, for many years, but you also served in the Oregon State Legislature yourself and got a little bit political. So how did you first get involved in politics and public policy? Uh, let's see, I ran for office in 2014, but I think initially my first you know, dipping my toe in was to get really involved with some nonprofits and start serving on boards. Um, had some advice from a great mentor years ago that said, if you really want to get involved in your community and in your state, that's how you do it. So I think I served on my first board when I was about 19, maybe 20. Um, and then from there, I just kind of, you know, you get on one board and um, do some good work there and it kind of morphs and you find yourself on different boards. And, and before I knew it, I ended up on some statewide stuff and had some opportunity to do some really neat things for our state and um, saw some need and then just branched out from there. And what did you do for work before you went to the Oregon legislature? So I have a really interesting background. So I own my own company. Years ago, I started a marketing um, and advertising company. So I did that focusing on mainly on equine type events. Uh, and then I worked from home part of that time doing association management work as well, raising two little kids. Uh, which was the best job I've ever had, I'll tell you. Toughest, but the best. Um, and then I worked in a legal office. So I've got a little bit of a legal background, thought I would always go to law school, but didn't end up doing that. Um, ended up managing a medical clinic. Um, and again, had another business, started doing grant writing, 
based on the work I'd done on some of those nonprofit boards that we talked about, I saw a need. And so just volunteered my time. And then before I know it, some folks said, Hey, you know, you really ought to do this. So I started that company years ago and did grant writing and communications work, and then found myself um, in different positions around that as well. And I, you know, I just uh, last year um, was still writing grants. So um, I found myself to be a little bit too busy, I think, to continue that work this year, but uh, love that, that kind of work. And so I did that for many, many years. So I've had my own businesses. I've worked in the legal field. I've worked in the medical field, been in business development work, marketing, and yeah, and then coached for many, many years volleyball. So, so very broad you, array of things I've done. So you get elected to the legislature in 2014. And so that fall, <laughs> they usually kind of do this, like, which committees do you want to serve on situation? And sometimes they'll go, oh, farmer, they need to serve on ag. Oh, you've got this person who's a lawyer, they should yeah. serve on judiciary. Did they look at your resume and go, we don't know where to put you? So we did have some interesting conversations because in addition to that, one of the other crazy things about me, I was grew up on the east side of our state, but then also lived, you know, at that time, you know, about equal parts of my life on this side of the state. So I had a very different background too and grew up around farming and ranching and all of that stuff. So um, initially we kind of started out like that, like, you know, what do you want to do? And that was an interesting conversation. And I'm glad you brought that up because that was one of the things that actually led me to run. Cause when they sat down with me and said, Hey, would you consider running for office? I said, you know, what do I have to offer? I don't like no. And then they said, tell us your story. And I did. And, you know, started from nothing and, um, did these businesses and all these different opportunities in my life. And so each one of those things actually play really well into the legislature, because if you think about it, I had kids, so I had you know some education and I worked for a school district doing grants for many years. So education was one. Um, you've got business and labor. I owned some businesses, so I understood that. And then healthcare, I was on the business end of running a medical clinic, so I understood healthcare from a very different perspective. Transportation. So I found myself my first term on Education, transportation, uh, subways and means um, for natural resources, given where I came from, right. uh, started out there and then ended up on um, eventually got on health care. Um, I was on business and labor. I have a long I honestly was really, really fortunate and ended up on um, over my two terms on many really, really cool committees. Did the e-board, um, lots of special appointments and. That's a really great opportunity. And um, so then you kind of, and I didn't tell you about this before we started, but I, I was looking for just the coverage of your election and I came upon a wonderful headline. You might even still remember from Statesman Journal. It reads, Republican hack wins in House District 19 race. And I was just like, man, what a, that's just a rough headline. Yeah, it, it just makes you it's just not very nice. It just no. they should have. Don't you think they should have thought that through a little bit more? Maybe the editor was just saying, oh, that they're Republican. That's their last name. They didn't even think about it. But man, that's a rough yeah. one. I actually talked to him about that. They said, we didn't mean that. And I said, <laughs> oh, OK, I'm going to give you this one. Sure. Come on. And, you know, 30, I've been married 34 years and uh -huh. 34 years ago, I said to my husband, you know, I really like my last name. It was it's O'Reilly. Mm. And. And I, you know, I'd love to hyphenate my, you know, but 34 years ago, that was really unheard of. And I got the scene guy from um, him and his dad who said, what do you mean? What's wrong with our name? And so I didn't hyphenate. And then fast forward all of these years, I get into politics and he literally says to me, man, you really should have hyphenated, especially yeah. after that article came out. And, oh, there was much more around it uh, that that had tentacle for sure. Yeah. Did you have That's to, okay, did you have to give skin. up your claim to the O'Reilly Auto Parts empire or, uh, or, or do you still have, are you still part of the family? Yeah, I'm still part of the family. That's, yeah. that's good. That's good. Um, <laughs> so were, I mean, did you enjoy serving the legislature or did you, you find it difficult? Cause if someone could look at two terms and say, Oh, that's not very long. Maybe she didn't like it. What, what was your experience? <clears throat> so I, honestly loved it. Um, and while it's challenging, yes, and it's difficult, um, 
there are so many great things about serving. And I think for me, it was one of the most humbling experiences of my entire life. Um, you know, every day you'd pull underneath of that building and park, there's, you know, in our parking area. And I just would say to myself and to the Lord, um, you know, help me do your work and help me to represent these people in a way that um, I'm supposed to do that. I felt that weight, um, but in a good way and just, uh, was truly honored and felt such a responsibility to do the best job I could in representing all the people that had asked me to be there. Um, I loved the policy work. I enjoyed running for office and getting to know people. Um, I enjoyed, you know, my colleagues and the friendships that you make. I enjoyed working with people in the building. Um, you know, I think there's, you know, it's a different time now than it was then. You know, we had lunches together every day. You know, we went out on the floor and battled, but then we'd go in and have lunch together. And so you had a camaraderie. Um, and, you know, people would say there's nothing good that happens in that building. It's not true. Um, and you, you've been in there too, you know. I mean, there's goods and there's bads. With the, mm -hmm. But I think that happens with anything. But where are you ever going to have a job where, excuse me, um, you're going to be put in a situation where you're going to talk about issues so diverse and so different. You know, in one breath, you're talking about building roads and bridges for your state. The next minute you're talking about children and, you know, what's happening with them in school. The next minute you're talking about women's reproductive rights. The next minute you're talking about what the definition of some horrible crime sex act is or something like that. The next minute you're talking about carbon tax. And so at what point in your life are you ever going to be in any type of a job or an environment where you touch all those different areas and not have different personalities and different thoughts and different, um, what do I want to say? Oh, mindsets, I guess, or different experiences that you all bring to the table. So for me, I really tried to look at it through that lens and tried to understand my colleagues on both sides of the aisles, you know, what drives people, what motivates them. Um, I spent time talking to every one of them when I first got into the legislature about who they were, what they enjoyed, not about how they got there or about politics, but really tried to get to know them so that when an issue did come up, I had a different understanding and I could say, oh, I'd go back and look at my notes and go, now I understand why they're really passionate about this issue, which gives you a different perspective. Um, but I think the misconception that it's all bad there is just not true. And, and I honestly loved my time and, um, sad when I left, but, um, not a lot of people know this and I'll share, I guess, um, with you. I didn't leave the headlines read that I left to go take a big lobbying job at the home builders, which I was blessed to have that job and was really thankful for it. But I left because my husband had been really sick. Um, he'd gotten meningitis first and spent 30 days in the ICU or got out on the 30th day. Three months later, he had, what was it just season? Two or three months later, he had, um, three heart attacks and wow. I had to make a decision on where my priorities were and what I needed to do for my family. I didn't tell the press that because it was private. Mm -hmm. Um, and I made the right decision and I'm thankful that I get to be back in the building doing what I'm doing. And that's what we're going to talk about today, which I'm super excited about. Yeah, um, so I think you either love it or you don't. And I love it. And I love what that building stands for and the sanctity of it and what it means for our state. So there you have it. That was awesome. I appreciate you sharing <laughs> that. So uh, when you serve in the legislature, were they talking about housing in the same way that they're talking about housing today, or has there been an evolution in that conversation? I would say there's definitely been an evolution. Um, we were having some conversation, but nowhere near what it is now. Um, definitely elevated and rightfully so. We're in a housing crisis. We've got a 140,000 unit shortage um, right now and in the next by 2040, they say we're going to have 584,000 units short. So um, I would say it's definitely heightened from when I was there, for sure. 
And for people who may not be familiar with housing markets and and how they work, what does 140,000 unit shortage mean for the existing housing stock for people buying houses, selling houses? So that's relative to the current demand. So when you look at the demand for what we need in housing and what we're actually producing, there's your shortage. And do you think that like, is it because production has gone down or demand has gone up? I mean, what's kind of the the primary driver or is it a combination? It could be a combination of a little bit of both, but the primary driver is production's gone down, production has slowed. Um, if you think back at, you know, when everything happened with 2008, the big crash, um, we're still trying to recover from that. We have not made it out of that. And when everything just stopped, not only did we stop building what we needed to build to maintain what the demand was during that time, but then everything, you know, they opened the floodgates after that. And we've got, you know, red tape we deal with all the time. We have a very complicated land use system, which I'm sure we're going to talk about at some point during this. Um, so many, many different factors, I think, play a role in where we ended up today. But it certainly is different today than it was when I was there. Absolutely. So you mentioned the urban growth boundaries. And I think that's a good uh, kind of um, transition. So I'm not an expert. I will I will say this up front. I'm not an expert on uh, Oregon land use law. I'm not sure that anyone even who works in land use law yeah. is an expert because it is complicated. But the kind of general thesis of the Senate Bill 100 and Oregon's land use system is um, not just local control over building, but more of a broad centered, centrally controlled growth that one slowed how fast you grew two controlled how fast you grow in terms of protecting the outside you know forests and farms and the things that you have that typically surround your urban areas um, right. Oregon's obviously a very beautiful state and a lot of people want to protect it but the way you go about protecting it has consequences in terms of of the ability to 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 build and to expand your cities. And when your Oregon for the last couple of decades that has had strong population growth, the most obvious example of that, which is we picked up an additional congressional seat, meaning that we in the last decade grew much faster than most other parts of the country. Yep. Um, and then, as you said, we're already underproducing because of the results of the 2008 housing crisis. You have this system that's incentivized to slow growth in a period where you need to expand and expand faster. What what has that what are the pain points in that system that are leading to the housing crisis, at least from the, the perspective of of home builders and, and those who are on the production side of housing? Well, I think like anything, you know, you have supply and demand. So if you have a lack of land, there's no supply. So the prices go up. And I think we're in a crunch to provide affordable housing. And you can't provide affordable housing if you don't have affordable land. And so you've got land within the UGB that is expensive. There's not a lot of it. Again, supply and demand. Then right outside of it, which given our complicated land use system uh, that I agree with you, no one can speak to completely um, unless you're Dave Honeycutt. You can get pretty darn close if you're Dave Honeycutt. Um, Dave Honeycutt represents the for, uh, Oregon property owners, I think, for yes, those who are not. Who um, has been you know, working on land use laws for decades. Um, and he still struggles at times because it is so complicated. But um Back to your question, though. So you've got land within the UGB, and then we've got land just right outside the UGB in what we call our urban reserve um, that was actually put into the goals way, way back to help us if we ever ended up in a situation like we're in now where we have had growth. We do need to produce more homes and we need more land. Uh, that being said, there are certain groups who don't believe that we need that land and are fighting tooth and nail to keep the urban reserve, which is exactly what it was intended for. And that is, it's an urban reserve. It's a reserve amount of land and not all cities have it. I think there's 14, I'd have to count, but I think there's close to 14 that do and Metro. Mm -hmm. um, and so you've got the land within the UGB, let's say you have a two acre parcel and it's $800,000 sitting right next to it in the urban reserve, you've got a 20 acre parcel and it's $200,000. So 
there's a big but you can't in, you can't develop that that parcel in the urban reserve into no. a subdivision no not unless they allow for an expansion outside of the urban growth boundary which our land use laws don't allow unless you pass bills like we just tried to this last session or you have tried an attempt at it that john chandler and dave honeycutt tried for decades as well prior to you that. have um and you're referencing john chandler <laughs> who's the former uh i think was he the former ceo of oregon home builders and yes. um and he served in that position for a lot of years might have been a, a lot couple, of years a de- at least a decade maybe more yeah and so thinking about that and and there you know there's a couple different groups for listeners who aren't familiar the two groups that tend to be on that um the oregon a league of conservation voters thousand friends of oregon and then they have a conservation oregon conservation network that kind of encompasses a lot of the smaller and local <laughs> groups and so those are the the groups that tend to be on the one side talking about and and so they'll say that there's a lot of available land and they've even got some cities convinced they have enough land is that is that true or is that is that circumstantial to particular cities or I mean, how do you view that that response? Well, that's where we need analysis on what 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 available land do we really have? Right. So they did pass the second version of House Bill 2001 um, this last session. And they're doing the Oregon housing needs analysis, which is going to require the cities to do what were in our goals, our land use goals years ago. And that was to say, what one, what do you need and what do you have for buildable lands? So to be honest, we don't really know what outside of what we know, meaning we're the ones that are out there. Our builders and our developers are out there saying it's not there. Um, but we've got thousand friends and we've got LCV and all those folks saying, oh, no, no, we have plenty of land within. Um, the problem with that land is it could be deemed wetlands. It could be uh, a cliff that you can't build anything on. There could be setback requirements or different, you know, jurisdictional issues and requirements that DLCD either puts on or the local jurisdiction puts on that creates such an issue with that piece of land that there's no way you can build on it anyway. So what they're saying that we have in buildable land isn't technically really what we do have. So the work that's going to come out of House Bill 2001 and the Oregon Housing Needs Analysis work, we're talking seven years from now, we'll start to see what we actually have in buildable lands inventory. But right now, we need houses. And we know from our perspective, for sure, we're the ones boots on the ground. Our guys know they're out doing it. We don't have the land. Um, We've also um, been told that they now are realizing some of these groups that they've also inhibited some of the building and made it really difficult for us within the urban growth boundary. And even if there is land in there, there again, our hands are tied and we can't build on what's there anyway. So there needs to be a combination of both. We've got to be able to build within on whatever is there and we can't just keep going up and not go out at all. Um, and oftentimes they don't want us to go up and they don't want us to go out either. So, um, and right. we need to I mean, you think about the, the, the common, not in my backyard situation applies yep. often where people don't want their views obstructed building up, but they also yep. don't want the sprawl building out. And so it's kind of, uh, it, it becomes a challenge yep. to try to make those two things work. You know, um, you also have a situation I think where you have, um, those who are advocates of the system that we have saying use the urban growth boundary system to expand. Well, you had Bend um, take oh, oh, like 10 plus years to be able to expand their urban growth boundary. And that was for a combination of reasons. I know one of the significant pieces is that every time you expand your urban growth boundary, now there's requirements for reducing emissions. And yes. sometimes those targets are achievable and sometimes they're uh, fantasy achievable. And so I think that that is also one of those things that leads to making it difficult for the, the cities to to expand and bring in more buildable land. And those are also subject to approval by a lot of different boards. And then annexing that land in the cities is another step where sometimes voters go, well, I don't want the higher tax rates or the other. So there's just a lot of pieces that are yep. required to get it moving. And that's if you're in it. I mean, that's if you're doing an expansion. 
Then mm-hmm. if you actually even try to build on land that's already there and do a development, we often run into the same roadblocks and, and you can have a project if it makes it through, it could take three years or four years. We've got some that have taken upwards of 10 years to actually ever be able to put a shovel in the ground mm-hmm. based on requirements from one department to the next and permitting to the next. And so there are many, many layers to this and um, it's and certainly are there, not. Are there fix. costs associated with those delays? I mean, so you might Absolutely. think that the land's just sitting there and the company can just go pick it back up whenever it gets approved, but there is there ongoing cost for that. There is. Absolutely. And two, and during that process, typically they're fighting against a group, like you mentioned before, Thousand Friends or OLCB or another arm of that type of a group that files appeal upon appeal. And it's up to the developer and the builder to pay those costs that they incur to defend themselves. And oftentimes they win, but it takes, it can take years. And that's going to require a combination of, of on the ground knowledge, your, your, um, I want to say architects, but that's the wrong word, but uh, maybe architects, your engineers and lawyers, yep. probably yep. land use lawyers. Exactly. Um, and so I- what do you, yeah. Anyway. Oh, go ahead. Well, I mean, it's just it, not to mention the fact that um, you have the NIMBYs, then you have the organized folks that come against. You end up in a situation where a lot of your smaller developers will just walk away. Mm. They'll just walk away from the project and not build on it or sell it, or they'll do the one and not come back again because it was so miserable and so costly that they just couldn't do it. And then you end up with just huge, large builders and you cut out all of the smaller guys. Well, and to me, my, I mean, this might seem sound um, backwards to some people, but I think the larger builders are constrained by more things than some of the small folks. And so I think that the small, some of the small builders can sometimes afford to build houses differently than some of the big builders who have a lot of different considerations yeah. that they have to take in. <laughs> And so they have, you know, they have their couple floor plans and they have to develop it and they have to make a certain amount on each house in order to make the whole project pencil. Whereas a smaller developer might be able to um, not not need to make as, you know, as much on a particular project and is able to help take that out of the price of the house, along with just being able to find other economies of uh, not instead of scale, but be able to find places where they can save money in order to build a house affordably that the others just can't because they're doing it at such a large scale. So that ends up becoming detrimental to yep. the affordable housing conversation. Yep. We need all types of all kinds from all different areas. We're not going to get out of this with doing it just one way. So what's the way out of of the crisis? We're taking off the table. No one's, as far as I know, no one's introduced a repeal of Senate Bill 100. So we're taking that off the yeah. table immediately, right? So yeah. where do you reasonably start to walk your way out of this housing crisis? Because some people are saying you've got to do the the needs analysis first. Some people are saying you got to do the you know the high profile 3414 stuff or or more than that. I mean, what in your perspective, what? What starts the direction out of the problem? Not where we're just training water, but where we're actually making gains on housing. So I think there's a multitude of things. I think you've got some short-term things that you've got to do. We could look at how we're doing permitting processes. Um, you know, the idea that we have folks that go in and they have to get 14 or 15 different permits from eight or 10 different departments. Um They've got to start looking at that and how do we streamline some of that work. Um, We also, during the session, talked about different variances and things that we could do to help with some of what we have in within the UGB. We talked a little bit about that earlier. So if you've got a piece of property and you could put, let's say, a fourplex on it, but because of the setback requirements of, say, 20 feet on each side, just an example. I don't know. every, Every city is different. But let's say you had a 20 foot setback, but if you were to get a variance or um, of 10 feet on each side, you could build build a fourplex versus a duplex. Tell me what the, about what a setback requirement is. Is it from the road or from other houses or? They're from all sides. Yeah. So you've got setback requirements from both sides. So if you have property on each side, you have your setbacks from the road, you have your 
sidewalk, you have, yeah, slopes and all that kind of stuff. So looking at it and saying, okay, could we, could we change this up in order to accommodate more housing? So looking at it from a lens of how do we produce more houses rather than a lens of, we don't want to do this, or let's just put more red tape or let's just go slower. Um, We got to speed things up. Um, Looking beyond the permitting side and what happens within all of that, I think local jurisdictions, some of them don't have the staff. Um, We haven't done a good job of helping them out. Some have plenty, some don't. Um, There are some local jurisdictions that want building and they want to do the right thing. And then you've got some who are just obstructionists. That's just the way it is. But um, dealing with those issues, we did have a housing and accountability production office put together in one of those bills as well. That was in 3414 that would have held some of those uh, local jurisdictions more accountable. Um, I think you've got to look at expansion of DEGB. Again, we talked about affordable lands. Um, I know that also trees have been a very contentious issue. Um, When you look at affordability and it costs you $65,000 to take down a tree on a lot in Portland or 50 grand, uh, that lot that was 250,000 that then goes up over 300, it makes it pretty difficult to build anything that's affordable. Um, let's see, what else do we have? I'm, I'm thinking through our list. Um, so you've got the variant stuff working through that, the code requirements looking into, I think longer term, we've got to look at the wetlands and what we're doing with that. Um, when so you I talk about in, the, ex- I lived in a, um, uh, neighborhood when I first moved to Albany, we bought one and it was one of those subdivisions that was developed in a low, in a wetland area. And so they had to do. I don't know if they called it remediation or something like that, but basically they have to Uh officially, you know, put up some uh, chain link fence or whatever to protect a certain portion of the wetlands. And then we're allowed to build on another portion of the wetlands, I guess. And I, I didn't quite, it didn't seem like a specifically notable wetlands to me, but that's the requirement. And so that's what they had to do in order to get what was available, buildable land out of that area. But I thought that was somewhat fascinating. I think, that, that's going to take some time for people to understand what a wetland is and mm-hmm. really looking at our wetlands and saying, do they bring value or not? And in a situation like that, if, if you can't tell it's a wetland, it probably isn't. And so why are we calling it a wetland? Um, since the changes at the federal level, we need to take a look at what we're doing on that front. So I think you mentioned federal. I think that is an interesting question too. Um, is there, I know you primarily deal with the state level. Are there big federal problems or are there big federal impacts on our housing policy? Or is this primarily a state conversation? You know, for us, we're focused at the state level. So I would say it's primarily a state um, issue. But you also have, you know, we're also dealing with the FEMA, the map, the mapping, the wildfire mapping and that kind of stuff that does affect us here. So, you know, we're constantly watching and making sure that we're paying attention to what happens at the federal level. But I think if we're really going to move the dial, we've got to stick to what we're doing here at home home for sure. And the federal interest rate hikes, I think, have an impact, but that's an impact that is felt nationally in terms of the price of housing, because those kind of that kind of just goes into the current pricing of housing. And it's not going to be I mean, it would help if interest rates and and inflation went down. That would certainly help the price of housing, but it's not going to fix the entire problem, if I understand it right. I mean, it's we still have a supply problem. Yep, we still have the supply problem. Um, I do think that that does affect and it does slow down. And banks are, you know, when banks get tight with their money, it makes it tougher for developers to go get that money. So it does play a role for sure when they start to to tighten up a bit. Um, So I think we got to be looking at that because that also will contribute, which is why it's so important for whatever legislative fixes we do that the builders and the developers are at the table um, because if it doesn't pencil with the bank, it's not going to get built. And I think that's probably one of the tougher conversations that we have to have. We want affordable housing too, and we want to make sure that we do that, but you cannot script it to the point that it doesn't pencil out or the banks won't lend. And I think there's a misnomer that, oh, they're just out to build these huge, what are we, you know, we got Dean McMansions all the time. Um, and that, you know, the affordable housing is just off the table for builders. That's not true. 
But when you take a project to a banker, it has to show that it's profitable or they're not going to lend to you. And so trying to get that message out is pretty tough, but not being at that table is extremely dangerous, which puts us in the position that we're in right now, because if you try to script it and or through our land use system, again, script it out, uh, clearly it doesn't work. Well, and I think that the other thing, too, when you point that out is you is you say, well, why can't the government just fund those projects? And I mean, you you may have a response for this. My my cursory response is if you look at all the requirements we put on, um, you just look at the example with the chips project of all the requirements that you have to meet in order to get access to that money under what circumstances you have to give the money back if you can't complete the project and all that stuff. And I would say that it's just never going to make sense for a developer to go through, jump through all of those hoops on top of the hoops they already have to jump through in order to get access to money. Because if you're spending taxpayer money, you want it to be spent effectively and you want it to have, uh, ret- you know, e- even if it doesn't have, a, you want it to have a return on the housing that gets built if you're going to subsidize right. that housing. But most of the time that always comes with certain strings attached in order to for the lawmakers to prove that they're keeping track of that money appropriately. But those are expensive reporting requirements and they add a lot to it. Yep. And I don't care what they do. They cannot buy their way out of this problem. It's too big. The state cannot buy their way out of our infrastructure problem that we have, because that's a whole nother conversation and plays a huge role in all of this. We lack infrastructure and the costs Mm. for infrastructure are massive. And I think we're going to see some legislation. We did this last um, session and we will again this one. I think they're going to throw some dollars at it. And I'm, you know, we're supportive of that. But again, we can't buy ourselves out of that problem. We don't have enough money and we cannot buy ourselves out of the housing problem that we're in. We have to have market rate housing and we have like it's got to be we've got to help each other. There's no way we're going to get out of this if we don't. It is too massive. Makes total sense. Um, so where you, we talked about, uh, you've got the, you know, obviously the folks who are in public office advocating for housing, you've got the, you know, the advocates for housing outside the building that you're, you know, you're in conversations with and are a part of what does the average Oregonian who wants more housing and isn't looking to be an obstructionist, you know, you have, cause you can file opposition to housing projects in your area. I'm not sure there's really a simple way to file. Like, I actually support this. I think it's a good idea. What does yeah. the average Oregonian who wants more housing, what should they do? What, How can they, you know, affect change to in order to make housing more affordable in Oregon? I would love them to reach out to their legislators and say, uh, we support more housing in Oregon. And I think there's a way that we can do that and not, you know, hurt our environment. I think we've there's definitely this line that's been drawn. And it's unfortunate because I think it sends... Um, an unclear message and one that's not entirely the whole story. So um, the more that they can reach out to their legislators and talk to folks about the importance and the need for all housing types, I think is extremely important. They can engage with associations like ours, the Oregon Hill Builders Association, the Oregon Association of Realtors. Um, So lots of other places, you know, that they can engage, but Having been a former, uh, there's nothing like a constituent phone call to say, hey, I really believe in this. Because right now, we've got to move the dial at the legislative level, uh, without a doubt. And if we don't do that, we're going to stay in the in the mess we're in. And certainly the governor is not going to get to her 36,000 unit goal that she said. Well, uh, Jody, I really appreciate you bring a ton of knowledge on uh, housing and former legislative experience. And so I think you're the perfect guest to tackle this topic. Really appreciate you coming on the uh, on the program today. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate you. Awesome. Thank you so much.